It's 101. We're going to get started. I think people will probably join. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We will record this session. It's being recorded so that you'll be able to. Um, there's a ton of slides here. I apologize for how many there are. I kind of went a little bit crazy. Uh, and I will also send out the um, Google slide link to everyone. So if there's um, information here that you're interested in, you're more than welcome to um, to click on the links that are embedded. Um, I'll introduce myself and then Janine, if you wanna introduce yourself. So I'm Deb Ryan. I am an IEC uh, in Eastern North Carolina. I'm in Little Washington, North Carolina. And um, I also am a college advisor for uh, a small Christian school and now um, Columbia High School, um, which is also in Eastern North Carolina. Um, Janine, do you wanna introduce yourself real fast? Yes. Hi, I'm Janine Tager. And I wanted to just say hello and putting the little note on the first slide that your tenure is wrapping up this June. And I would love a new co-chair to join me. I am a high school counselor at the Franklin School of Innovation, which is a charter school. And I'm located in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, yeah, if anyone is interested in uh, taking on some of this work, which is really exciting and interesting, um, there's great support from SACAC. Um, please let either Jane Ann or myself know, and uh, we would be happy to talk to you through sort of what those roles are. But I, my tenure is done in this role in June. I'll still do lots with SACAC, though. And just in general, I would encourage people to volunteer with SACAC. It is a phenomenal organization. It's my favorite organization to which I belong, and it is volunteer run. So it's great if people, if you are engaged uh, in, if you're interested in being engaged in any kind of work, please volunteer because that's what makes it a great um, organization. Okay, so today is Advocacy 101. And again, it's a lot of slides, so we're going to go pretty fast. Um, I really wanted to give people an overview kind of of the General Assembly. Some of this might be sort of simplistic and things that you already know, which is totally fine. Um, but some of it hopefully will be some resources that you can that might be new to you. Uh, we do not know everything, obviously, and so if there are resources that you're excited about or things that you know about that are not included in here, please add them to uh, the chat, and Jane Ann is going to monitor the chat for us. Um, if you have questions about things, please don't hesitate to um, raise questions, um, but we'll kind of just go through. Uh, it's lots of um, sort of screenshots of what things look like and then the uh, resources, how to get to those places, which again is so why we'll share this recording and the slides themselves. So this is uh, probably one of my favorite spaces uh, for advocacy work in North Carolina. So Ed NC has this fantastic page, which again, you can link to, which really goes through kind of how the General Assembly works, what's happening right now, who's who, phenomenal, phenomenal resource. And you can subscribe to EdNC um, and a lot of the materials and, and sort of links that I have in this presentation come from uh, this page in particular uh, in EdNC and also just their resources in general. So really fantastic resource that I think everyone should know about just as a starting point. Uh, oop, missed a page there. So this is uh, from uh, at NC, this is kind of their update on what's happening right now in North Carolina. Uh, the budget is big, <laughs> really big and important. And as many of you know, uh, we have a divided uh, system in North Carolina. So we have a Democratic government and a Republican led legislature. So, which leads to a lot of challenges for both K through 12 and higher education. Um, but at NC again, we'll also have these great sort of here's what's happening, um, which I think is really important for people to follow. And some of the resources that are gonna be included in this are K through 12 resources as well. But I think it's important for us in North Carolina to see the trajectory what happens in our K through 12 system is really gonna deeply impact what's, what we're seeing for our high school seniors, for our high school juniors, and those students that are then heading into our institutions in North Carolina. So I think it's, under, it's, it's helpful to understand sort of the bigger picture. So some of the things you're gonna see in here are also um, K through 12 resources as well. So some notes on the General Assembly. How does it work? Uh, well, we have a House and we have a Senate. Uh, as you know, again, they are Republican led right now. Uh, everyone in the uh, General Assembly has a two year term. There are no term limits and our legislators are part time, which makes things kind of interesting. So they're less available in a lot of ways. Um, 
particularly if they're not in session, then they might be in other states. We have a biennium system, which means that we have a long session and a short session. And this year we are in the long session. It started in January um, and it will go into July. Um, typically this is when bills are introduced and the budget is set, which is why the budget is such a big deal right now, Governor Cooper's budget. Um, the short set no session will convene in the spring and bills that have passed one house and issues that are the commissions, particularly the joint commissions, um, things will be covered in uh, the short session, which will be again next year. The long session is kind of the when things get done is kind of the way to think of it. Uh, current Speaker of the House, Tim Moore, who's a Republican from Kings Mountain, 71 Republicans in the House, 49 Democrats, which presents challenges. It is a new ratio. So it is uh, in terms of our governor vetoing things, it makes it uh, dicier for him to veto because they will have the override. Um, Lieutenant Governor is the President of the Senate, and then Phil Berger is the President Pro Tem. Again, what the split is, uh, 30 Republicans, 20 Democrats in the Senate. These are really helpful ways. Uh, the representative contact info, the first two are really specifically like who's your representative, who's your senator. Um, the third uh, link there is basically who are your legislators from where you are. It's a map system that's really great. And then just a way for you, there are many ways for you to find your legislator um, for the United States government, for the U.S. government, um, but Common Cause is a really great place to start just to see who represents me um, because that can change pretty quickly. This is the General Assembly's homepage, which is actually really, really good and has lots of ways for you to sign up for um, notifications, particularly calendar notifications. Um, but I think this is a great, looking at other states, um, their legislative web pages, ours is actually really good, which is lovely. Um, and so it's sort of what's happening right now, uh, who's involved with things. And then if you look sort of through all of these uh, tabs up top, they're actually very thorough. They're, you can actually kind of go into a rabbit hole clicking on things. But I would say if you're if you're interested in our General Assembly, this is a great first place to start. Um, it tells you lots of really great information. And up here, one of the things we'll talk about later is sort of bill tracking. So if there's a bill that you're interested in, it's really easy to figure out sort of what's happening with it just by using this bill tracker that's up top. Um, many of you, if you're from my generation, will remember the um, I'm Just a Bill song from uh, Schoolhouse Rock, which I could probably still sing the whole thing. Um, I wish there was one for North Carolina. This is a super fun chart. Um, this is a chart if, the, if a bill originates in the House. It would just look a little bit different if it originated in the Senate. Um, but these are sort of all of the pieces of what needs to happen for a bill to become a law in North Carolina. I, this is a piece that we're going to focus on a little bit today, which is the um, committee consideration. So I'm really going to show you some of the folks who are uh, on some of those committees. So particularly the um, higher education committees, which are very important to sort of deciding things that happen for higher education in North Carolina. Um, but this is just a great sort of like, this is all it takes. It's a lot. It's all of these steps and readings and second readings and third readings um, for anything to actually become law. I think it helps people understand just visually the process and how complex and um, the number of steps that it takes in order for something to actually get ratified. It's it's pretty phenomenal. Uh, sometimes I think for things to actually become a law, <laughs> if you look through the, what their process actually looks like. But I, I, I'm a visual person, so I love this. Um, it really helps me sort of understand how, a, what, the navigation process is. I love that the concerned citizen is here and then kind of disappears. Uh, so the committees, I want to talk about the committees today, because this is really in the past two years, how we've organized some of the advocacy work that we've done is to reach out to people who are on the committees. So um, these are just links at the top to sort of the standing committees and then the non-standing committees, how you can just see all of the committees overall. But I wanted to show you today sort of who are on the university committees and higher education committees, just in some ways for you to see if there's if some of your folks from where you live are um, are on any of those committees. So this is the House Standing Committee. Um, these are this is the two chairs. And then these are uh, the members of the House University Committee. Um, I have spoken to in particular Representative Carney, who is from Mecklenburg and has is a longstanding member of um, 
the North Carolina legislature and is wonderful. She's actually just phenomenal human being and very inspiring. And, um, but it's changed quite a bit. So two years ago, we did a, we talked to lots and lots of legislators and um, this was a very different committee at that point. So it can change pretty quickly, which is why I think it's important to sort of review sort of who's doing what in each of the, um, the bodies. This is the Senate uh, Education and Higher Education Committee. Senator Lee, I've spoken with, um, he is very um, thorough and thoughtful in his uh, commentary. Uh, we didn't agree on a lot of things, but uh, it was a really interesting person to speak with. Um, and then this is the Senate Education and Higher Education Committee members. Um, I have uh, spoken quite a bit actually with Senator Chaturi, who is from the Cary area, and with Senator Smith, who is from the Edgecombe. She's, she was in the House of Re Representatives and was on the uh, House version of this committee, and now is a senator and is um, from Edgecombe and Pitt County. So she's right near where I live now. And if you want to be inspired by someone and entertained and just learn a lot in a very short period, um, I would strongly encourage reaching out to Senator Smith, who is just uh, amazing and so thoughtful and forthright about the challenges of serving in the North Carolina legislature and is just one of my new favorite human beings. I've talked to her several times, and she actually two years ago was on a panel that we did and was um, just phenomenal. And then there's also a joint, uh, for most of the committees, there's also a joint education oversight committee. And so this is not all of the members, but this is sort of who's part of that as well, just um, for education as well. And then I just think that these are really interesting uh, pages to look at. So again, this is the link, and this is what it'll look like when you, when you open it, to see what legislators, like what are they doing? What committees are they on? And you'll see that some of them are on, oh, out of committees. And so it's an interesting, I think, insight into the complexity of what they're thinking about and the complexity of sort of the issues that they're being presented from all sorts of different kinds of uh, lobbying groups, from uh, community-based organizations, for all sorts of different concerns. And uh, so I think it helps, just even looking at this helps to give you insight into how the best ways to approach legislatures, right? Because they are con they are honestly, I think, bombarded by people asking for things. And so the more, and we'll talk about this later, direct and clear and concise you can be when you speak with them, the better. They really need to know what you're talking about and what you want. I think the, the, the simpler that your ask or your outreach to them can be, the better. And I think, again, this helps you see the number of, issues that are going on behind the scenes for them and the kinds of things that they're that they're having to think about kind of all the time. So this is the Senate committee assignment page. And again, it goes on for pages. And then this is the House committee page. Um, they look very different, which I always think is interesting. Um, and again, you can see who has what uh, responsibilities, if there's a chair, if there's a vice chair, and all of the different kinds of committees, again, that people serve on. So in terms of starting to get news about uh, what's happening in North Carolina, this is where we start to get into lots of slides and I apologize for the number that there will be, but I think it's helpful for people to see. So the UNC School of Government, their legislative reporting service is great. You can sign up for uh, the daily bulletin. So it'll literally sell, tell you every day, like here's what's going on. In general, this website is also just great for um, the kinds of, issues that are going on, not just with higher education, but with all of the various things that are being considered um, in our legislature. And uh, really clear reporting, very concise, and I think helpful to get an overview of kind of what is happening um, within our state government. This is just some, maybe people haven't seen this. This is literally our uh, nc.gov, our website uh, for the North Carolina government. Um, some great things in terms of learning and exploring. Um, lots of links. If you click on the Your Government page, it'll take you in some ways back to sort of the websites I've shown you already for the General Assembly. But lots of really good information um, as well as, you know, how to get involved. Um, one of the things I strongly recommend if you're interested in, in, 
doing some of this work, but you don't necessarily have lots and lots of time, this might seem kind of a strange thing, but being a poll worker uh, is a really, really great way to ensure that folks uh, can vote. Um, my mom has served as a poll worker for several years, and it is very hard for them to get folks to staff polling places. And so if you're like, you know, I'd, I'd like to be engaged, but I don't know how, but I, I could take off election day, I could take off a couple of days of um, early voting. It's a really great way to ensure that people can vote, that there are enough um, uh, people working at the various polling places that people can actually get in and vote. It's it's maybe not something, it's a different way to look at advocacy, but I think um, ensuring that people can have their voices heard is really, really important. In North Carolina, uh, as you all know, um, we are not only governed in our higher education system by our state government, but also by the UNC Board of Governors, which can present some challenges and some interesting situations that arise. So sometimes the Board of Governors can make a decision that impacts our public system uh, without it actually having to get passed through the legislature. So that's not necessarily true of all states. Um, and the Board of Governors in North Carolina has a tremendous amount of power. They are, it's there are 24 members, they are um, nominated, they are chosen by the legislature, so there is a direct connection there. Um, and the governor, the Board of Governors deeply impacts who the things that happen for our students who are landing at um, the UNC system schools. Um, this is their uh, main page. And if you click on this, and I'll uh, show you in a second, if you click on this, you'll be able to see upcoming meetings and the materials for those meetings. Um, I follow the Board of Governors pretty closely, and they have, I'm trying to be very diplomatic, they have uh, taken to releasing the documentation about their upcoming agendas later and later is a way to say it, I think, um, so that it's harder to know what's gonna be covered in a meeting coming up uh, with a lot of time to plan and understand what they're doing. Uh, sometimes they won't release the agenda until just a couple of days before, which can make, again, things challenging. Um, and you can uh, watch any of the Board of Governors live stream meetings. Uh, there are closed sessions for the Board of Governors, um, and so um, those are the meetings that you can't see, but most other, pretty much all of their committee meetings and the big general meetings, so they'll meet in committee and then they'll all come together for their, um, their very large meeting, um, you can watch. Uh, it's super interesting to watch. Uh, I will, the only thing I'll say is that there have been a couple of times when I've watched Board of Governors meetings and my husband has come in to see if I'm all right because uh, I'm yelling a lot. And so they're super interesting to watch and to comment on without being able to actually have anyone hear you, which is probably for the best. Um, next two big meetings, the one in April and the one in May um, are coming up. And uh, the bottom of this page, so this is the how to watch those meetings. The bottom of this page, this is the um, the email, their their public contact. There are also before each meeting, there are um, places for public commentary so that you can go in and comment on the upcoming agenda. Um, and I know that some other people have much better relationships with and greater access to the Board of Governors. That has been a frustration of mine in this role is being able to um, kind of get a hold of people in the Board of Governors. But I know that folks, particularly those who work in the system, um, have much better access to the board members. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, a couple years ago, we did an action alert and um, had people reach out to the board before they were deciding the first test optional, um, the, the when that was first an, an issue. And they, they heard people, you know, we gave them this email address, the public at BOG in North Carolina, uh, email address. And during the session, they actually commented, we have heard from so many people, we got so many emails. Um, and so it, it can help for people to raise their voices again with the Board of Governors when they're making decisions about um, the UNC system. They often sometimes also just make decisions. <laughs> so it's it doesn't, you can't always do an action alert. Um, but it's, I think it's important to know 
what's going on behind the scenes and to watch some of these meetings and to see the kinds of comments that people make and the interactions that they have. Um, it's fascinating and it's also really enlightening as well. Um, so then this is, we're gonna talk just for a second about the governor. Um, so he has uh, both a cabinet and a commission. So the, these are the members of the, um, the governor's uh, ca education cabinet um, who come together to resolve issues that are kind of across um, uh, both the independent colleges, community college system, UNC system, um, DPI. So this is really everybody who's engaged with any kind of parts of uh, education in North Carolina. And then the governor also has this commission and there are two meetings coming up for the commission. So this is a super interesting thing. So this is a commission on the governance of the UNC system basically. So it's the governor, I think, um, trying to engage with some of the things that are happening with uh, the UNC system. It's a commission that uh, the two of the leaders I believe are former UNC board of governor heads and then they're also um, people who are the past presidents of the UNC system. And so it's a pretty impressive group who are on this commission. Um, I am not entirely sure what will happen with the results from this commission, but I think it's important, important for people to know that there are places for you to have input into um, you know, what's happening in our, in our public institutions. Yay, this is us. So I wanted to talk about uh, SACAC and about NACAC. So the SACAC government relations, again, if you're interested in this kind of work, please let Janie in or me know because we would love to have someone help Janie in, um, in the come next couple of years. Um, the government relations, this page is also really interesting because it has all of the states in the Southeast. So many of us who are either high school counselors or independent counselors, we are sending students to not just institutions in North Carolina, but across the Southeast. And so it's a really great way, the continuation of this page, what's down below, is a really great way for you to see kind of what's happening in other states as well. Um, as we know, lots of states are making um, some pretty, interesting choices about what's going to happen in their higher education institutions. And it's a way for us to sort of see what's happening there, um, who we can talk to in those states, the various government relations chairs in different states about what's happening in their states. And um, it's also a way for you to keep track of sort of action alerts uh, for our region as well. So um, the SACAC page in general, I think is great. And the government relations team is fantastic. Okay, let's talk about NACAC and um, David Hawkins, who is the um, chief education officer, and he is our main man when it comes to public policy and has been so generous to speak with us um, previously. Uh, he, uh, this is sort of what's NACAC doing, right? So this is the headquarters for the information about government relations that NACAC is doing. Um, and I think this is, I just wanted to take a minute and actually talk a little bit more about this page. So these are kind of some of the highlight issues that um, NACAC is really thinking about right now. We are very lucky that tomorrow Alice Doble and um, Ricky Hurtado will be speaking to us about undocumented students in North Carolina. Super excited for them to join us from Latinx Ed. Um, but one of the big things that NACAC is really, one of the focal points of their advocacy work right now is, um, is undocumented students. So the DREAM Act and legislation to protect dreamers um, across the United States. Um, and one of the big things for us in North Carolina is that undocumented students are not eligible for in-state tuition. And so that's something that we, I think, have asked for when I've spoken with legislators, that's one of the things that we've talked about quite a bit. Um, and depending on folks' party, uh, the different responses to the possibility of that becoming something that could happen in North Carolina. But that's one of the focal points, I think, of NACAC's um, legislative efforts. And then I just wanted to explain to people what the other things on this list are, because you might kind of not know what they are. So the HERE Act is, um, it's a $150 million um, act to under Title V of the Higher Education Act to help um, Hispanic serving institutions and Hispanic students um, achieve uh, college education. So it's really um, meant to specifically target Hispanic populations, Hispanically serving schools um, to ensure that students from those backgrounds have access to higher education and um, 
trying to reduce a lot of those systemic barriers, both in the high school arena and in access to applications and getting into um, two year and four year schools. So that's what the HERE Act is. Um, double Pell Grant is pretty obvious and uh, it'll be really interesting, I think, to see what happens with President Biden's budget and with um, the with the FAFSA being simplified next year, hopefully sort of um, it's going to happen. Um, what's going to happen with financial aid? And on Wednesday of this week, we are going to hear from Zania Lewis and her staff. At, they're called the Yes, She Can campaign. And um, they have a program called Discolored, which is about scholarship displacement and um, what happens when students uh, win scholarships, but then the scholarships don't actually help them with their um, with their application with their with their funding for schools? And so um, the double Pell grant is about financial aid. Uh, Dream Act we've talked about. HR twenty seven hundred is uh, it's an interesting act. It is uh, about ensuring that when a for-profit institution wants to convert to a non-profit institution, that there are very specific um, criteria for them to be able to do that. Um, so that's what HR 2700 is. It's really to ensure that for-profit institutions are pretty much doing the things that they are supposed to. That's what that act is about. And then the post act is, um, it is for promoting opportunities in skilled trades. So it is again, funding for students to be able to access um, skilled trades, which I think is an important piece of post-college planning or post-high school planning. Um, in, you know, it's so interesting to me, and this is a whole other discussion, but you know, when I was in high school, vocational education was so much more a part of what was was achievable and possible. And I just really feel that, that that's been a shift in American education that has um, damaged students' potential. And so I think this act is really trying to sort of reinforce the ability of students to get um, skilled trades and vocational training um, by funding access, all of those pieces. So that's what all of these pieces of sort of the um, NACAC, their focal points are. This is an advocacy checklist. This hasn't worked 100% correctly in the past few times I've been on here, but I, I'm hopeful that they're sort of transferring some information over. Um, but this is part of, it's on that same page, sort of what can you do every year? And then this is a one pager from at NACAC that really is talking through uh, the most important pieces of what NACAC is really trying to have accomplished for students across the United States. So equity-centered admissions policies is first and foremost, and I think there has been a ton of conversation, of course, about post-SCOTUS, uh, what might happen this summer with the Supreme Court decision, and what it will look like for students to, for sorry, for colleges to be able to continue equity-centered admissions when lots of policies might not be permitted. Um, and I think this is central to particularly us in North Carolina, what we're thinking about right now. Um, and uh, because we're part of the lawsuit and because of um, something we'll talk about in a second from the Board of Governors. Um, but this is really, I think, first and foremost on everyone's mind right now is, is what's gonna happen to race conscious admissions policies. Um, Maintaining ethical practices in college admissions counseling, both on the high school and IEC side, and most importantly on the college side. Um, as many of you know, in 2017, the Department of Justice basically uh, created a situation in which NACAC needed to uh, shift how they talk about ethical practices uh, in really fundamental ways. And so hoping that colleges will still maintain ethical practices is a big piece of what NACAC is, is focused on. And then this is something that we have uh, advocated for with uh, the legislature in the, the past few years, which is advocating for school counselors um, in schools, particularly in North Carolina, uh, increasing our ratios of school counselors and um, ensuring that they have the resources that they need uh, and also helping to create ways for them to have uh, training in college admissions practices. 
And then this is what uh, NACAC is hoping to have happen in this Congress. Um, so the Every Student Succeeds Act, uh, which is from Title IV, again, doubling the Pell Grant. Um, uh, President Biden's plan to provide lots and lots of funding to hire more school counselors and school psychologists, helping students' mental health. That is one of my deepest concerns with my students is the state of their mental health. And I know that it is a huge issue for, for all of us who are working with uh, teenagers right now. Um, increasing funding for college access programs, uh, spending five cents on the federal dollar for education. Um, and then again, the DREAM Act. So this is, uh, I'm very excited that Alice and Ricky are gonna talk to us tomorrow because I think that the plight of undocumented students is really important to our long-term success in the United States. Um, economically, socially, uh, in so many ways. And so the that this is continues to be at the forefront of what NACAC is, is proposing, I think is really important. Uh, this is just a way for you to see what's happening with the bill. So this is, for example, the Post Act. Uh, so this is from the congressional website. And so this is a way to see what happens with bills. Uh, again, in the and this is beyond North Carolina, but uh, I think just still interesting. Um, this is the part that I find the fa most fascinating, which is the tracker. Sort of where is it? What's the most recent thing that happened, and then where is it? And the number of bills that, if you go into this website, again, a little bit of a rabbit hole, uh, that have, <laughs> that are just sitting there, it is a lot. Um, and so, really, to again uh, to understand the complexity of that's things actually getting passed, how hard it is for something to actually get passed, um, and how many bills are just sort of lingering in limbo. Uh, it's a pretty interesting sort of study, I think, to do. And I'm sure lots of people have done a lot of work on that. But this is a way, again, if you're interested in a particular bill to see um, what the history is. It's also really neat. You can see what actually what the bill says, what's happened to it, um, if there have been amendments, who's sponsoring it, the committees that are associated with it. So lots of information about bills in particular. And then I wanted to make sure that we talk about the North Carolina School Counselors Association. So um, a huge part, again, of what we've done in the last couple of years uh, for uh, advocation, advocating with the North Carolina legislator is asking for more school counselors in schools. And the, a couple meetings ago, we had the president and the past president of the um, NCSCA speak with us and that was such a great collaboration. Um, so I think it's important for you to see their website and to know that they are doing this work uh, in really important ways. They just had an advocacy day in February. Um, and so this is their, their legislative page. So this is their legislative priorities and lots of really great information from this website as well, sort of on uh, how they approach uh, the North Carolina legislature, what their language is, the kinds of things that they are specifically asking for, um, what happens on their legislative day. So again, I think just a great resource. And, and I think it's really important for us to know that there are lots of different groups that are working towards many of the same goals. And I think the more that we can collaborate on those and also echo other folks' language and uh, policy requests is really important. We're, we're adding uh, our voice and our weight to their interests, which I think can be empowering for sort of for everyone. And then this is the uh, North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. So uh, DPI website, which many of you, if you're in higher education, might not have looked at. But again, I think it's important for us to understand what's happening K through 12, because those are the students that are going to be coming to our institutions. Um, this is the website. And then this, uh, Janie Ann sent me this, which was so great. So there's a K through 12 education legislative update from uh, DPI. And Jane, you, are you still on? Can you, you can sign up to uh, get an up. How often do those updates come? Do you know? It's about every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, you can just subscribe to that, right? Anybody can subscribe? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And I find it very helpful, actually. Mm -hmm. um, read through it. Just when I get those emails, it reminds me to be focused on this. So I think it's great if you do sign up for a couple of these different websites. 
because I think our voice, we're, we are the connection to our students. And so I think because we are connected to our students and we know what's going on in the ground, it's very helpful to be reminded of what's going on and to be reminded that it's important that our voices, which are actually the students' voices are heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and this, I think, again, we are the connecting point. I think that's such a great way to think about it. And so for those of us who work directly with high schoolers, uh, we know what's coming to the higher education institutions, right? So it's it's that connecting point and making sure that we're not just taking students when they're hitting senior year and saying, okay, well, now good luck to you. It's really that development of that trajectory all the way along. So this was such a great resource. And then I want to talk about ways to track education legislation. So there are a few different ways. Um, so this is a National Conference of State Legislatures. This is a, a very specific. And so you can actually uh, sign up for this again, and that it will track bills for lots of different. So if you had a healthcare legislation that will do bill tracking, it's lots of different kinds of um, bill tracking. Um, but this is a great way, again, to see that broader view of what's happening across uh, the United States, which can sometimes be super depressing, but also interesting. Um, and so this is a great way to sort of see um, what's happening in, in all of the, the legislatures. Uh, again, Education Commission of the States, this is another way to uh, track state education policies. Um, And then this is a really interesting resource uh, because it kind of works and it kind of doesn't. So this is from the Chronicle of Higher Education. And so this is a, a specifically DEI legislation tracker, um, which is because that's something that's a huge issue currently and is something that's under attack. The, the challenge here is, so for example, in North Carolina, uh, House Bill 187, which is kind of a recreation of a bill that came up two years ago that Governor um, Cooper vetoed. Uh, House Bill 187, it's called the Equality in Education Act. It's for uh, K through 12. And it is about basically anti-CRT DEI initiatives in K through 12 institutions. Um, so, but that's not going to appear on this page because it's not uh, higher education specific. But I think knowing about House Bill 187 is incredibly important to us. Um, so that's why just relying on one tracker, I think, or one source of information uh, can be misleading. Because if you looked at this page, actually, um, if you looked at that, we are tracking 26 bills in 15 states so far. It does North Carolina doesn't have anything highlighted, which is kind of a false state of affairs because there's House Bill 187 in the House um, and then the Board of Governors, as many of you know, in um, February decided that they were going to have to remove uh, anything that's related to asking about DEI in admissions uh, uh, applications or for people who are trying to be employed, which is a huge shift and it's a big uh it's a big impact on what's happening with DEI initiatives in North Carolina, but neither of those things appear on this. And so I think, again, this is a great resource, but it doesn't necessarily give the full picture of what's happening in North Carolina, which is why I think it's important to sort of have a few different sources that you're relying on um, in order to, to really see what the true state of things is in our, um, in our state. Uh, I love higher ed works so much. Um, I think this is a really fantastic um, website. This is um, uh, this is kind of the our hopes for 2023 is kind of what they're hoping they'll see. But amazing. I you can subscribe to higher ed works and you'll just get fantastic news kind of all the time about what's happening in our institutions. Um, I just I think these are some of the best. Uh, very concise and informative emails that I get. And I, Jane, and I think you're exactly right. It, getting the emails reminds me that this is important work, right? It's like, yes, this is, we should be paying attention to this. This is what's happening. And so I'm just a, a, a huge fan of higher ed works in general. Uh, NC 
Policy Watch is another thing that I um, subscribe to that I think is really fantastic. Um, and uh, again, it's not just about higher education, but you're going to see a lot of the higher education things that are happening in NC Policy Watch. And so this is just from the other day um, about sort of the uh, anti-critical race theory legislation. So House Bill 187 that I was just talking about. Um, so this is, a, a again, a great way for you to sort of see what's happening in our state. Um, it also will think about like uh, federal legislation that's going to impact North Carolina. So it's a way to see that as well. Um, but a great way to sort of see kind of the things that are happening. And then this is just, um, uh, it's from, the, it's called the Pulse, it's from the um, Policy Watch. Uh, and again, this is uh, something that has just happened. This is very recent. So I just want to pause on this for a second because, so the Joint Legislative Commission on Government Operations has requested this documents relating to DEI training. This is not a commission, this is not either the Joint Commission on Education. So this is, again, if you're only looking at one thing, it doesn't give you the full picture. So it's not the Joint Commission on Education that has requested these documents. It's the one on government operations. And so there's just understanding the spectrum of who's engaged with higher education, the different kinds of folks that can be impactful on what happens in our higher education system and our K through 12 system, I think can be really important. So that's why it's really helpful to see different kinds of information from different kinds of resources, because you'll start to see, uh, <laughs> it actually might be nice to just look at a page that didn't have anything about North Carolina and be like, yes, we're all good, but that is not the case um, at all. And so really being able to, to get information from different resources that help you have a fuller picture, um, I think can be incredibly helpful. Uh, inside higher ed, most of you, if you are engaged with higher education in any way, I'm sure uh, are receive inside higher ed, subscribe to inside higher ed. Uh, North Carolina has been a lot in the news lately in inside higher ed. Um, and uh, again, a way for you to see state policy, also just what's happening in higher education in general. Um, I This is probably something that I look at pretty much every day, if not every other day, but um, really one of the best resources that I have seen for just seeing what's happening in higher education overall. Um, less very specifically uh, bill, and law oriented, but a really great resource, I think. Um, and then this is just something that I was introduced to by one of my parents. So Capital Broadcasting Company has a, an opinion page. Uh, it's it's pretty vigorous. Uh, it's, it's also pretty outspoken, um, but it's a really interesting way, again, to see uh, this is something you can subscribe to. And I uh, love this. I, it comes to my inbox. Um, I think pretty much every day, or maybe it's every three days. It's quite often. And it's it's not just, again, higher education policy or education policy. It's kind of everything that's happening in the state legislature, but it gives you a sense of really what's going on. So this, the one that they're talking about today is about um, suspensions uh, or in schools, sort of what's happening with um, laws that are coming about for, for K through 12 suspensions. Um, so it's a really interesting way, again, just to sort of get commentary on what's happening in the legislature. Okay, <laughs> this is completely random, but I feel like I should include it anyway. Um, Jeff Jackson is in Charlotte, and he is now in the House of Representatives, uh, the um, federal government. And he's just one of truly, I'm just going to be biased here. He's one of my favorite human beings. And I followed, he was um, running for Senate and then withdrew so that Sherry Beasley could run. Um, but his Twitter, if you don't follow Jeff Jackson, you should. Uh, and it doesn't matter, honestly, which party you belong to or sort of where you fall on the political divide. Uh, he has probably one of the best uh, kind of almost daily reporting systems of what actually happens in Congress. So almost every day he tweets just a short video of here's what happened. And so he started when he first got to Congress, 
uh, he started and said, here's, um, this is what it's like when you get here, and this is how you get to be on a committee, and here's what we did today. And so he just does, um, honestly, almost an everyday sort of like, here's what happened today in Congress. And they're so simple and insightful and forthright. Uh, he talked one of the best that actually got him a lot of um, public attention in a really good way. He talked about, he said, I made a mistake today. And the mistake was that he met someone from the other party. He's a Democrat. He met a Republican who he had, he said, I had really strong preconceived notions about this person. And I literally physically accidentally like ran into them um, in uh, going through a hallway. And, but we ended up having a really long conversation. He said, what I learned from that was how thoughtful this person was. And even though we're on opposite sides of the divide, uh, this is the kinds of conversations that need to happen in order for us to make policy happen, like to make the, the country better. And so if you don't subscribe to Jeff Jackson's Twitter, I just strongly would recommend it because I think it's one of the best insights into what's actually happening in Congress all the time that you can see. And he's a North Carolina boy and um, he is really dedicated to our state and um, it just such great information from him. Okay, I wanna just talk quickly about some of the best practices for actually reaching out to legislators. Um, the key ingredient, again, is simplicity and being very clear in what you're looking for. So before you reach out even, what is it that you want to accomplish with reaching out to this person? And um, there's a variety of things that you could ask for, but these are kind of the th big three. Are you asking them for funding or for money for something? Are you asking them to change a law or propose a law? Or are you asking them to stop something else that's already happening? So are you asking them to vote against something that's already in progress? What is it that you want? What is the outcome that you want? Lots of different ways to, to reach out to legislators. So uh, you can call, you can email, you can go in person. Um, at some point, hopefully in the future, uh, we can do another uh, legislative day where we can actually all meet. Um, we were hoping that the um, NACAC college fairs would come back to Raleigh so that we would have a chance if everybody was in town that we could do a legislative day um, sort of around that. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but maybe next year. Um, you can fill out contact forms on their websites, et cetera. Uh, just in my experience, and this is truly just me talking right now, email works really well. Calling, you're likely to get uh, like an intern or never get someone or get a voicemail. Calling is really difficult. What has worked best in my experience is to email the legislator and their assistant. I cannot stress how important it is to also email their assistant because those are the folks that are actually keeping track of the their schedules, their calendars, uh, what they're doing. I've had so many conversations with assistants that have actually been really helpful and beneficial, but um, they, if you just email the legislator themselves, you are very likely to never hear back from them. Um, Jane, wasn't that something that you had said was a concern when you were trying to reach out to people? I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. No, I mean, I'm sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> yes, I think, yes, if you just email them, I think you're not going to hear back, but you're right. I think if you email and or call, I've called and left messages and had assistants call me back. Mm -hmm. um, I think they feel that it's a part of what their job is. So mm -hmm. I definitely think reaching out to both the um, senator or representative and their assistant is definitely the way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it, they just... Um... But there's and they're typically really lovely and helpful I've found and so that would be a key ingredient I would think um and I just want to kind of show you what how to find how do you figure out who their assistant is so first we'll look at this and then we'll talk about the emails themselves so this is again Jay Chaudhary who is um uh, wonderful and I've spoken to many times um so if you click on the biography of any of our state legislators it'll take you to a page that looks like this which is super lovely it gives you their district it gives you um kind of which county they're in, uh, and sometimes districts go over two counties. Uh, it gives you their email address, and then it'll always kind of look like this. Sometimes it'll have their email address, but sometimes you have to click on it, and then it'll create the email. But this is how you find their, their assistant. So this is the way to get there. Um, and then typically, I would say if you're going to write an email, uh, who are you? 
why you care about this, giving your own personal context, I think is incredibly important. What issue are you worried about? Um, if there is an applicable bill, very, very important. Um, that to say, I'm radically against House Bill 187, here is why. Um, if there's any research that you have or personal experience, they love stories. That's one of the things, um, and Ricky can talk about this maybe more tomorrow when we talk to him, but um, when he was in the state legislature, he said, the stories matter, right? If you can tell a story about a student, if you can tell a story about uh, you know something that's happened at your institution, stories matter to people. That's how they relate to issues. So if there's research that you've done that's relevant, if there's a story that you can tell that you think is really important or will help your cause, that's very, very, um, uh, it can be very, very impactful. And then what is your, what outcome do you want? So ask for something specific. Um, just sort of saying like, this is my thoughts about whatever, DEI in schools. It's not going to help them. They need you to say, this bill should not pass. This bill should pass. This really being as specific as possible, I think is one of the most important things you can do. Okay, Whew, that was a whirlwind. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of things. Jane Ann, thoughts, uh, commentary on all of the things, anything that you that I missed or or anyone else are there resources that you use or things that you uh, wish we knew about or wish we would do um, in the future that would be great to hear about. I was going to say, if you have resources that you think about later, email those resources to me or to Deb or to both of us, preferably. Um, that would be great because it might be something you come across like, oh, I wish I thought to say this when we were at the lunch and learn. Um, the other thing is, um, well, two things. One, I think you, as much as it seems overwhelming to watch what's going on on a national basis, I think things travel in waves. And I think we've seen it with a couple different issues. So if something is happening in other red states, I think it, it could move as a wave. Um, you know, like it may, like North Carolina might not be the one who wants to initiate this kind of change, but once other states have initiated it, and then it doesn't seem like such a large thing to put on the table, or they maybe don't be responsible for bringing, putting it on the table. Once other states have, it's like, oh, well, then we can do this too now. So I think it's good to watch what's going on, on the national level. Um, and then the second thing I want to say is if you are attending and you do not mind, if you could put your name, your institution, your location, and your email address in the chat, it's just helpful for us to know who is aware of our events. Um, and maybe if you're a SACAC member or not, because um, we want to make sure that we're trying to outreach to non-SACAC members and school counselors who may not be members so that they have access to this information. And we can also have their input of what's going on in their schools. That would be um, yeah, and if you're not comfortable putting that information, actually, let me just do this um, into the uh, chat. I'll put my email address in the chat. Um, and then, Janian, can you just put your email address in the chat as well so that people can? Uh, can Pete, I sent a message out, but I wasn't sure attendees could see it. I don't the know chat they... only shows to host and panelists. Oh, I no. think I can send it to everyone. Did you just see my everyone my email address pop up? Maybe, maybe not. Yay. Okay. And then Jane, is your at the FSI? Is that your email? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um. Great. Well, thank you. This I was. I was not sure that I was going to make it through all those slides. So I'm super happy that I did. I went a little bit crazy and I apologize if that was overwhelming, but we will send this uh, recording and I will share the slides with everyone. Um, and please join us tomorrow uh, at one and Wednesday at one. Uh, tomorrow we'll hear from Alice and Ricky from Latinx Ed. And on Wednesday at one, we will hear from um, Zania Lewis and Michael and Michelle from uh, yes, she can campaign and discolored about scholarship displacement. Thank you so much for being with us today. And um, if you have questions, concerns of any kind, we would love uh, for you to reach out to us. And if you're interested in particular in serving, uh, helping out with Jane Ann with uh, government relations the next couple of years, that would be great. Uh, or just volunteering with SACAC in general. It's a phenomenal organization. Um, and I hope that we'll get to see some of you at the conference um, in April, which would be great. 
So thanks yeah. so much for being with us today. Janian, anything else I'm to add? No, I'm just not seeing anybody putting anything in chat. Are you saying, do you have access? Oh, no, that's okay. They can email it to us. It's fine. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Deb, so much. Thanks for um, sharing all your knowledge. And I'm trying to soak up as much from you as I can before you depart. And I would love to have- well, I'm not really going anywhere. I'm just, I won't be doing this exactly anymore, but I'm not going anywhere. And I'll still be super engaged with us, Zach. So I'm not disappearing. <laughs> I won't even be a guest on some of our lunch and lunch. <laughs> That's perfect. That's great. Awesome. Have a really great day. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.